Welcome to SUPSAFE Module 7, The Rise and Fall of the Tide. Operating on the sea, an estuary or a tidal river is a notch up from paddling on a non-tidal river or lake, as we need to factor in the effects of the tide. The next few slides will help us to understand the cycle of the tides, what's the best time to go, and how to avoid any strong tidal currents. Okay. Let's run through the contents. First up, we'll look at understanding the tides. Then we'll look at the rule of twelfths. We'll take a look at rip currents. We've got a spot of homework. And then there's a further reading section. OK, if everyone's ready, then we'll begin. Cycle of the tides. The tides are governed by the gravitational forces of the moon and the sun. Here we have the tides across a monthly cycle for Seton Carew, and we can see that spring tides move to Neeps, back to spring, to Neeps again, and finally we move back towards spring tides. Spring tides occur a day or so after a new or a full moon. Spring tides occur when the sun and the moon are aligned. High tides are higher and low tides are lower for spring for spring tides. Springs is a Viking word for lack of and refers to the lower low tides that occur for spring tides. Neap Neap's tides occur when the sun and the moon are offset and the rise and fall is the smallest for Neap's. Neap's is another Viking word for abundance and refers to the higher low tides. There are many websites and apps that give tidal information for the UK and I'll give a few examples in the video description for the reading section. Tidal range. In most areas, there is a high and a low water every 12 or 20 minutes or so. And, and the tidal range is the difference between high and low water. So for spring tides, they have the largest tidal range and occur with the full, uh, full and the new moon. Neap's tides have the smallest tidal range and occur at the first and third quarter of the moon. The important factors for paddling, uh, for paddlers, sorry, are not having to walk a long way to the water, or we don't want to arrive somewhere to find that we have to walk through hundreds of meters of, of mud um, or across um, some rock. So, so if we look at these pictures here, if we came to launch uh, and we found that we had to walk through lots of mud or we arrived here and again finding that we had to walk through lots of mud, it'd be much better to time our um, time to depart or to arrive when the tide, when the tide was in. Sim similar, similarly here, if we were planning to paddle um, straight across here and not having to have a large detour around um, uh, around this island, then obviously if we turn up here, we're, we're going to be disappointed. But if we time uh, time it correctly, then we can we can just paddle um, paddle on by. The other thing that we want to do as paddlers is to try and avoid paddling in a strong tidal flow, and that's what we'll cover in the next slide. The rule of twelfths. In order to predict the height of the tide at any given point, we need the rule of twelfths. The rule of twelfths is used to approximate the sine wave, sine wave behavior of, of tides by dividing the tidal range into 12 sections. So if we look at the picture where we go from low to high tide, so we go from low to high tide, the tidal range has been split into 
12 segments. So if we said um, what would be the, 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 the change in the height of the tide two hours after low tide, so we would go to the two out, so low tide, two hours. So that's three twelfths or a third. So if we said our tidal range was 10 meters, then a third times 10 is 3.3 meters. So the tide will have risen 3.3 meters in the first two hours following a low tide. If we look a little closer, um, we can actually see that half of the entire um, span of the tidal range occurs in the third and the fourth hour. So if we then look at, at the effect of, the, uh, of that on, on the tidal flow, So we can see during the third and the fourth hour, the average tidal flow is 95%. So, so here we are just breaking it down. So we've got the third and the fourth hour. The average flow is 95%. So that, that represents the strongest tidal flow. If we look at the fifth and the second hour, that's about 70%, so that's medium tidal flow. And then if we look at the first hour, either side of high or low water, and that gives us a tidal flow of about 25%. And that's the, that's the, weakest, um, the weakest tidal flow, and, and that, that occurs around um, slack water. Just one final point. Um, for this slide. So, so if we're at the same location and the same tide cycle, then the NEEPS tidal flow is 50% of springs. So we're saying if we're paddling in a NEEP, uh, a NEEP, a NEEP, a NEEP tide, then that's going to be half of the flow of the corresponding spring tide. So that's, that's quite a, uh, quite a difference. What does this mean for paddlers? So let's just have a look at um, a, a, few, um, a few examples. So if we're saying we're, we're planning a trip and we're gonna paddle up an estuary, then, then we need to time our trip to avoid the third and fourth hour after a high tide, as this is when the tidal current will be at its strongest. If we're planning a, a there and back trip on a on a tidal river, then we're best to time our launch to coincide when the tide is going out, so when it's on the ebb. Have our lunch and time our return when the tide is coming in, so when it's on the flood. And and this way we'll have the flow with us on both of the legs. And finally, if we're planning a, a short crossing to an island then the best time is around slack water, i.e. an hour either side of high or low tide. But please remember, uh, we may need to time uh, our return to coincide with the next high or low tide to make sure we return safely. Okay, um, the next few slides um, cover rip currents. So we talk about what to do if we're caught in a rip, um, and also um, some information about um, um, how to spot them. Um, rips tend to commonly form um, where we've got um, sandbanks uh, on the beach and the waves break over the sandbank. And then if there's a low point in the sandbank, then the water rushes. Um, back out um, through that gap. So if we're caught in a rip current, the most important thing to remember is don't panic. Stay calm and force yourself to relax. 
we're not going to win a fight against the ocean. So we need to swim or uh, slowly paddle conservatively out of the current or relax and just let it carry us past the breakers. When we feel it start to slacken, we should then start to swim uh, or, pa or paddle uh, parallel to the shore before actually actually heading back in towards the shore. Okay, this slide is about um, can we spot the rips? So this is an aerial picture uh, of a beach here, and we can see that there's um, there's quite a lot of quite a lot of rip currents there. Obviously. Um, it's very difficult for us to kind of get get this view. We've actually got this view on the beach. So um, the best guide is is to look for the darker green water. So we can see we can see the waves and the breakers coming in here, and they're quite grey. And then the rip current is the dark green colour, which is um, which is going out um, going out from left to left to right. And we can see there's a patch here with um, with no breakers. OK, um, almost there. Just got uh, two more slides now. So um, a spot of homework uh, for, all, for us all to do. So the first thing is um, let's download the tide table um, for your nearest coastal location and work out when will be the next spring and neap tide. When, when will the next spring and neap tides occur? Number two, for your nearest coastal estuary, Look at some timings for paddling inland and avoiding the strongest tidal flow. And the final final bit of homework is for your nearest tidal river, plan a there and back trip with a lunch stop at slack water. OK, this is the last uh, last slide. So it's basically further reading. Um, just want to mention a couple of things that I found really useful. Um, the first is a book. Uh, it's called Sea, sea Kayak uh, Navigation by Franco Ferrero. It, it's an absolute excellent, excellent book about coastal navigation. Um, it's really, really easy to read. It's written in very, very plain, very plain language, and it's got lot, lots of examples. It's definitely recommended. And, and this book is used by British Canoeing for their coastal navigation and um, tidal planning courses. I think it's only around ten pounds, so it, it's uh, really worth uh, really worth getting that. If that's if you're if you're going to planning to do lots of paddling on on the coast, that will that will definitely help. Um, and the second is tides, wind, and waves, and what to be aware of. This is a recent article by um, that appeared in Submag. Uh, Submag UK, so I'll, I'll, I'll also include the details of that in the video description. Uh, so great, congratulations, you've completed Subsafe Module 7, well done.